All right, uh, now really we can go to question and answers. So uh, just a quick sort of guidelines for here. We'll have two mics up here in the front, so you can kind of walk up and line up and we'll get to them. Uh, a light will briefly shine on you when you're gonna ask your question. <laughs> and say your name, where you're from, and try to make it a question. Hello, Matt. Um, Ryan Kenny from Miami. Uh, as a volunteer, speaker, organizer, and contributor that passionately supports WordPress and our shared mission to create a more open uh, and accessible web, I'm concerned because I don't believe that we currently have um, a stated accessibility policy, uh, community code of conduct, conflict of interest policy, uh, code of ethics, diversity and inclusion policy, or privacy policy. Mm -hmm. um, between the foundation and, uh, so my question is two part. The first is, between foundation and the project, who would be responsible for assisting us in creating and enacting those policies? Mm -hmm. And the second part is, how is we as a community, how can we help uh, make this happen and try to enact some of these policies over the next 12 months? That is a good question, thank you. <laughs> One thing, I do think we do have some of those policies in place, like definitely we have a privacy policy. So we do have some of those already. Maybe we need to make them more discoverable. Yeah, I don't believe that they're published. I'm on the I'm a co uh, core contributor for privacy, mm -hmm. um, and we've been working as a team on it, but I don't believe that it's been finalized and published yet. Well, let's make sure. It should be in the footer of WordPress.org, um, but I believe we've had one of those for a little while. Um, for the others, I would say that the first priority is always making sure that what the purpose of each of those policies is that WordPress is embodying. And I'm very proud with the improvements we made to all those areas um, in the past year and beyond, you know, especially, particularly accessibility. And that is in spite of there being a policy or not. We've tried to enact bigger changes in WordPress in a policy first way in the past. And to be honest, uh, it felt nice, but it didn't always make things actually change. So when we've said, every commit must be X, Y, Z, or something like that, or just maybe had it as a broad policy. Like I think we did one for accessibility on the theme directory once. Um, it didn't have the same impact as when we actually built the tools or worked alongside folks to make the changes. Um, so I do think about that. Uh, I also think about how can we make all of these policies that be about things that we want people to do, not all negative framing. I was a little, it was pretty noticeable when you came in here. Some of you might have noticed like the first three things you saw when walking into WordCamp US were like uh, costumes, weapons, <laughs> and a code of conduct. I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, like little placards for those following along at home. They were like big black and white placards saying uh, what wasn't allowed mostly. I also wanna, I think we've always done really well in WordPress where we don't try to enumerate every possible thing we don't want people to do but really talk about the principles of what we want to create together. And I would love for us to also evolve how we present ourselves at work camps to incorporate more of that. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, in terms of those other policies, let's talk about tomorrow at Contributor Day. So we can sort of dial in which ones are there versus not and talk about what might be a good process for getting the rest out there. Perfect, I look forward to that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, see you then. All right, we're gonna to bounce to the left. Hi, I'm Alicia from Canada. And uh, I was really happy to see a number of security talks this year. And there was one this morning on auto updates where I learned that there's like 80,000 plugins now for WordPress, which is awesome. But uh, I work for Sakuri and we know that a lot of sites get hacked through plugin vulnerabilities, not through core vulnerabilities. Yeah. So I'm curious about, you know, the future of auto updates for plugins. But my main question is, you know, most users don't know this. So how can WordPress and the community better inform administrators or maybe even email somehow notify them about security risks of delaying plugin vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. the potential risks of breaking sites with auto updates, and some alternatives like virtual patching? That is a super good question. And one of the things that uh, is one of the nine focuses for the year, I think it is super, super, super important. Um, we're laying some groundwork. So like that admin email I just showed will allow us to more, we want to use that to message people not just about core like we traditionally have, but also about the plugins they're using. So that is part of the reason for getting that in. And sometimes we have to build the foundation before we build the house on top of it. So that was one of the things that we realized we didn't really have a good up-to-date version of. Um, over time, you know, very much 
the hill that we're, or the mountain we're trying to climb in the distance is that you just log into WordPress and it's safe, secure, and you get the latest and greatest. And you shouldn't have to think about whether something's a plugin, whether it's in core, whether it's part of your theme, whether you customize your theme, but then there's a security update to a different part of it. Like we need ways to handle all of these possible cases and update, at least for sites that allow us to, right? Set the file permissions as such, um, as many sites on the web as possible. Uh, I would like to call out and thank the web host here. So almost every major web host, certainly all the ones that we promote, do automatic updates of core uh, for both major and minor releases. And you know, that's been fantastic both for us, because that means people are getting the latest and greatest WordPress, but also for them, because that means the sites are less likely to get hacked or compare a four-year-old version of WordPress to like today's proprietary alternative. Um, the other thing that I'm starting to see more adopt, uh, we do this on WordPress.com, lots of other hosts are starting to do it too, is auto-updating those plugins. Yeah. So I, if you are a web host and you're not auto-updating plugins yet, figure out how to make that opt out. <laughs> and get as many of your sites on the latest versions as possible. It is true uh, that most uh, vulnerabilities we've seen, and certainly the ones that have affected most sites, have been in plugins and themes. And themes are particularly hairy, right? Because people might have customized the code there. But these are, it's all just code. And so for sites that give us the permission to modify these things by the file permissions, I think that we'll be able to tackle it. Um, it is really, really impressive what we already have. I know for those of you who are at the Auto update panel. Uh, we had Nason and a few others there. You know, we forget that it wasn't that long ago, five or six years ago, that everyone had to update their WordPress manually. And we now get over a 99, usually 99.9, 99.5 auto update rate. And allows us to get usually like 60% plus of the WordPresses in the world on the latest version within a few weeks, which is not as good as iOS, but way better than Android. So we're <laughs> As a true platform, which WordPress really is, it is an operating system for the web that's gonna power so many things that we know now and so many things we can't even imagine yet. It's so, it's really, really important that we uh, invest in that auto-update mechanism. Thank you. So thank you. It's a great place to contribute, especially if you work on security stuff. Hello, right? Yeah. Hi, Matt. My name is <coughs> Monika. I'm from Joost and from the Netherlands. And so at Joost, we're really into Gutenberg and we're making Gutenblocks. We have a lot of schema updates in Gutenberg. But our research shows that only half of our customers use the block editor. Mm -hmm. And that's hard because that means that we have to basically maintain two products. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you know how we can convince more people to start using the block editor. Because there is a lot of negativity surrounding it, and we're trying to be supportive, but it, it's, it's hard to get there. And I saw you post some of these stats. Yes, it was the post with the most comments we ever had. <laughs> I, be I believe you're assuming that every user of Classic Plugin is not using Gutenberg, correct? No, we did research within our audience and asked them, what are you using, Classic or uh, the Block Editor? And so half of them answered, we used the Classic Editor. Ah, so more of a survey? Yes. Yes, I, I know surveys aren't <laughs> all, but still it's, it yeah. shows that a lot of people aren't using it. And So we, we have about, just by the numbers, we think, like I said, almost three times as many are using Gutenberg than not. So we think only about 25% are kind of using the classic editor mm -hmm. of people who have updated, and not all of those are using the classic editor all the time. Some of them are switching between Gutenberg. So it's 25% or below that are still on there. I think the way that we get people on is first improving Gutenberg, yeah. right? There's been so many changes. Um, if you're one of those people who's not on Gutenberg yet, that's okay. We're still making it better. But I please, I'd encourage you to take every couple months, like every two or three months, every major WordPress release, try it out again and see if the things that frustrated you have been addressed. Um, two, I think it's blocks. So you notice how on that, uh, that tweet, uh, Hannah talked about how I really want this cover block um, I do believe that block-first adoption uh, will really help things. And so as, for example, in Yoast, if I'm just making things up, like let's say you had a really cool new feature that was Gutenberg only, that would be a great reason for people to upgrade. Uh, though I say that knowing that you all have done as much to contribute to Gutenberg as like anyone else in the world. So actually a quick round of applause because pound for pound, Yoast gives more back than almost anyone. 
as CEO, I know a lot of that's due to you, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think that is what's gonna drive it along, but also let's recognize that we're only a year in, we've got 75%. That last 25% will probably it'll be like a parabolic curve. Um, but I do think that, I mean, we still have 10% on versions prior to 5.6 of PHP. So I do think that we'll kind of asymmet asymptotically approach like a 85, 90%. And that's the point when as plugin developers, I would say you can really focus on Gutenberg first for everything. I just hope you're right. <laughs> I'm, I would I be really very surprised. I mean, we'll check this next year. We can yeah. update all these stats. I'd be very surprised if not 90% or more of all new posts going in WordPress next year were, um, were Gutenberg. So, okay. Thank so you. But we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Right? Because think of it also some of the stuff coming around the corner, like real-time co-editing. Right? I could see that being a really compelling feature for people that'll help them make the leap uh, to Gutenberg. And of course, in Gutenberg, you can still use a classic block so you can actually still have almost exactly the same interface inside of Gutenberg. So there's, there's uh, lots of reasons for people to upgrade. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Let's see over here. Let's check time. All right. Hello. I'm Milana Zap from Serbia. So I'm raised, born and raised in communism, and now we try to survive democracy. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Me too. Yeah. Oh, well, the second part. <laughs> So uh, looking at open source project, the idea to me is closer to communism, but I wouldn't advise applying that. But also democracy doesn't work. So um, I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, my question is, um, looking at WordPress, I don't see any system there. And I wonder when will we see some something that we can uh, identify as a system for making plans, making decisions, some, what are the names, something like that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I will, I'll take at face value all your value statements on different political systems. <laughs> um, and say that WordPress is gonna look different and maybe none of the political uh, analogies directly apply because it is software. And but so there, there are other open source projects that have some kind of system. Yeah. And it works. I, I think we should call what we do the WordPress system. Okay. To be honest, like, Wh when will we <laughs> see it? Uh, it was actually one of the, I know the WP governance project kind of fizzled out, but one of the great outcomes I think was they kind of documented how decisions get made, yeah. uh, the team structures for doing so. Um, the good news is that, you know, basically everything except, you know, like, choosing the jazz name for a release <laughs> happens in a Slack or P2 or GitHub or track channel somewhere. Um, you know, there's even, you know, there's a, a contributor to WordPress uh, who I was talking with and they were like, ah, you know, what happened? The about page got made in like this secret process. I wanted to be part of it and didn't realize that that all just happened on track. So almost everything you see happens as part of an open process. So there's a lot of transparency. And so for the actual organizational structure, I think that it's changed in the past, it will change in the future for depending on who's contributing, their strengths and weaknesses, and what uh, all organizational structures are a series of trade-offs. So what we're trying to optimize for at the time. So prior to when I took back over kind of the lead lead role, um, we would say that for each release, there was a release lead that had ultimate authority, including over myself, for what was going to be in that release. And you know the buck stopped there for everything. And what we were trying to do there was increase uh, the sort of flexibility that release leads had because we had gotten to a space where releases were a little more incremental and we want people to feel the autonomy to do bigger things. So I would say that kind of like an outfit you try on uh, for different outcomes that you're looking for. And these different organizational structures will try different things for different parts of WordPress. The key that for everything we do, I think will be that transparency. Yeah. And of course that we're open source at the end of it so that yeah. the product is something just like that film was Creative Commons. It's so cool that whatever we create as a community is available to the community as well. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. We needed, if you have any good words for that too, like what is kind of a transparent duocracy or something like that? <laughs> All of these words have trade-offs, so.
Hi, my name is Paul Wilson. I'm from Hawaii. I actually came here on another conference, but I think most of your Southern California automatic employees were on my same plane. Cool. And I learned about this WordCamp, so I jumped over to here. So, <laughs> uh, um, but I teach digital entrepreneurship at a university in Hawaii, and WordPress historically has been the main thing that we go to. And so I have two questions that deal with that in particular. First is the bullet point, and I want to make sure I got it right from your presentation, implementing full site editing that kind mm -hmm. of slipped in there at the end. And, uh, and I feel that's what's really been eating at WordPress's market share as you have Wix, Weebly, all the other ones that I see my students gravitating more because they like the customization of being able to edit full site without being restricted to themes. And so my question on that one is we've seen acquisitions in the past, such as WooCommerce, uh, where you've brought them in. And we mm -hmm. see think, tools like Divi, Elementor, PageLayer that already have all of that in place. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you guys would consider to help make it more competitive and make it more realistic for people that are just getting started where they can customize without having to be locked in theme-wise? Totally. So a good way to look at it, there, there's probably at least 25 that I looked at of these page builders mm -hmm. that would each have its own data model, it's each way of doing things uh, for solving this problem that you're, you said. So part of why we started in Gutenberg was to provide them kind of like a common rails that they could all build on top of. So page builders, I don't think are going anywhere, but they won't need to reinvent the wheel of the basics, like the core CMS stuff. That'll now be handled inside of Gutenberg. They can build on top of that and create lots of cool things outside of there. Uh, the full site editing is basically the realization of the original promise of, of Gutenberg, which is what we wanted to do was essentially flatten WordPress. Take all these different concepts that you would learn in different places around WordPress and make them all blocks. So you could learn a block once and you knew that anywhere. And what we're doing in, with the customization phase is breaking out the post box. So right now, all those blocks we showed, by default, you can just have inside post or pages. We want you to have that in headers, footers, sidebars, wherever you want. So we're doing a lot of the work there to port things over. There's some more that needs to be done. Like navigation block is still not finished. It's a, it's a very complex interaction. Uh, but certainly by this time next year, and hopefully in the early part of next year, we'll have it so your students and yourself will be able to take, like I said, look at any site on the web and just using some blocks, maybe the 2020 theme, be able to recreate that. So that is 100% where we're going. Uh, we're not, as far as I know, not going to acquire any of these plugins, but you also don't need to, right? Because the plugins are going to continue and they're now going to be able to uh, move even faster and work together more, which is also something we hear users say. Because in the past, like choosing one of these is almost like locking yourself in to a particular way of doing things. If you want to use a different theme or something else that's not compatible, you're still locked in. So this is a very user centric model of trying to create, solve this problem for the entire WordPress ecosystem. So on the second, well, we're gonna, we got a lot of people waiting, so we're okay, going to jump to some I other questions. Really quick on the, well, it's not a really quick question. I'll let you jump over to All it. Right. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hello. And you've got the mic. Perfect. I do. Hi, Matt. Michelle Ames from Give WP and WP Coffee Talk. And I would like to lighten this up for just a quick second and ask you a fun question. Mm -hmm. I ask every guest of my podcast, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made with WordPress and what did you learn from it? And what's your proudest WordPress moment? Oh. Um, the biggest mistake is a, longest, a longer story. But there was a, a hot nacho episode is, is what it was referred to. Hopefully, most people in the room haven't heard of it. A few have. But super early on with WordPress, um, it was basically like completely unfunded. And I had like run out of money. And we were getting how to designer to redesign the logo. Actually, Jason Santa Maria, who did do the logo we currently use, but then ran out before he was going to do phases two and three, which were redesigning the website and the WP admin. Anyway, long story short, like someone paid us to put, paid me to put these links on the website that were totally spammy. <laughs> but it was kind of before web spam was a thing. And also might have inadvertently, like, didn't invent, but certainly popularized a way to hide content using CSS that Google was not yet aware of. <laughs> 
And so that was definitely the worst thing I've done to WordPress and the web. <laughs> uh, my initial penance for that was uh, creating a kismet, <laughs> was, which was to create something to fight web spam, especially which I understood what people were, were doing there. Uh, but then hopefully the 15 years of WordPress following that. And one of the proudest, you know, I get incredibly proud every time we come together for these big work camps, US, Europe. Uh, and last year, having 5.0 ship and being able to talk about it and see how the community came together. And I mean, that really was the biggest change we made in our 16 year history. And this idea of going from kind of a document model to a block model of editing is, it's impossible to overstate how important that is to the future of WordPress. So seeing how that came together and how we iterated in public, how it was, all that happened, definitely one of my proudest WordPress moments. Fantastic, so, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Matt. My name is Wolf Bishop. I'm uh, with WP Top Hat, and uh, I live right here in Southeast Missouri. Cool. Um, so kind of home for me. Um, I'm going to kind of screw up the trend that she just tried to set up with a bit of a more controversial subject. Okay. Um, there's we one of the greatest things about WordPress is the fact that it's released under the GPL, which means we can use, redistribute, change plugins, themes, anything that's released under that license as much as we want, either for free or profit. And, and we love that about it. This has brought about a trend of, of grow, a growing trend of companies known as GPL clubs, which redistribute plugins either free or for profit. Um, and there's a lot of controversy in the community about this. Some people are absolutely for it and others are definitely against it. And this kind of attitude is mixed between both plugin or developers as well as end users. I've spoken to developers who support it, developers who are against it, the same with end users. Mm -hmm. So I think the community might like to know what is your official or unofficial opinion about these types of companies? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, I'll say it's allowed by the license. So it's something that is, at least in all the cases I'm aware of, like that's the license, when we create GPL software, it's explicitly with that freedom. And we couldn't prevent folks like that from doing it without taking a lot of freedoms away from everyone here in this room. So it's one of those uncomfortable, almost like the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights. Like, sometimes it's uncomfortable, but it's really, really, really important. Uh, my personal view on it is that, you know, the customers there will get what they pay for. Yes, they can get 100 plugins, well, one, it's weird to pay for that in the first place if they're, they're price sensitive, but they're not supporting any of those developers. They're not practicing Fire for the Future in their own case by voting with their wallet for the software that they use. Um, support that. I mean, I, I've started now where I pay for stuff I don't even need to pay for, you know, donations or Patreons or stuff like that, just because I want to see more of it in the world. Uh, how you spend your money is just as important as how you spend your time and any other resource. Uh, you're supporting a certain worldview. Uh, you're going to encourage more of whatever you're paying for to happen. So if you're seeing companies like some of the ones we've mentioned today that are giving a lot back to WordPress, doing a GPL, creating great user experiences, supporting Gutenberg, all that sort of stuff, even if you don't need to, maybe just pick up their yearly license or something and think of that as a way of supporting more of what you want to see in the world. And, um, you know, for these companies that are are kind of taking lots of people's work, but not really giving much back, either to those core things or to core. I say maybe choose not to spend money there. Great, oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Olivia, Olivia Bissett, and I'm from Miami, Florida. Obviously, um, I think it's safe to say that I'm from a different generation Mm -hmm. from most of the people in the room. So my, <laughs> qu my question to you is, how do you think WordPress, or is either how, how do you think WordPress is going to be adapted by the next generation of kids in K through 12 schools? Or how do you think you're going to change the WordPress so that way kids in K through 12 schools who want to learn WordPress and want to join the local WordPress meetups, like how they joined robotics <laughs> and different things. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, first, thank you. I believe, Olivia, you were one of the speakers at this WordCamp, right? Yes. <laughs> Very modest. <laughs> so the example that you're setting is something that inspires. So this is going to be on YouTube later. And boys and girls, maybe of your generation, will see you here asking a question, being a speaker at WordCamp in front of a thousand adults. And you know, it's kind of beautiful. When I got started with WordPress, I was 19. And you know the old comic in The New Yorker, like on the internet, no one knows you're a dog? <laughs> I would think like, it's great, on the internet, no one knows that I'm a 19-year-old kid in Houston who doesn't have a comp sci degree and like is learning to code. <laughs> Uh, people just were looking at the code I was creating, and we started working together, and we're able to create something that became a community, became a product that powers a lot of the web, and that I'm still excited to work on every single day when I wake up. Uh, so those examples being out there, I think, really help. The Hero Press stories. We probably need some more younger folks on Hero Press. Um, I see Topher somewhere here. Uh, you know, just kind of get more of that out there. Kids camps, I think, will help. And finally, you know, we need to. Well, this isn't finally. We need to make WordPress easier and more accessible. That will help with younger generations as well as older generations. And the last plug I'll put in there is you know, something that happened this year uh, was Automatic, which is my company, bought Tumblr. And we announced that we're going to switch all that to WordPress. So there's going to be half a billion more WordPresses in the world. And Tumblr definitely has a younger audience on it as its primary user base. And so I'm very, very excited as you know, it's not going to be the first year, but probably second or third year. As those become WordPress on the back end, Tumblr.com can be like a React front end talking to the WordPress API. And it can have a different user interface on top of that. Um, and those folks, much like before WordPress, there's a generation that learned to code you know, CSS from MySpace and things. Like by going where there's a lot of youth activity happening already, and it's a pretty fun site as well, um, the customization and the path we have there could allow them to graduate to being WordPress and maybe graduate being someone as cool as you talking at WordCamp someday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Matt. I'm Becky Davis from Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been doing this a long time. I have <laughs> sites that are out there that are six and seven and eight years old, and I'm still maintaining them. And they have thousands and thousands and thousands of posts in multiple languages. Uh -huh. And you want me to switch over to Gutenberg? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so, I do, but you don't have to. Right. So my real question is, I've heard rumors that the classic editor is going to die in the future. Mm -hmm. Please tell me that's not true. <laughs> what did we officially announce for a classic editor? 2022? Yeah, that's not cool. Uh, <laughs> well. There's a lot going to change between now and 2022 I, I get <laughs> in the it. world in general. Like we'll all be like doing WordCamp on holograms or something. <laughs> but so we, I think it went from Gutenberg release. We said four or five years that we announced at that point that we were going to continue ma maintaining the classic editor plugin. In reality, in open source, when things have usage, it gets maintained. And so if classic editor still has a couple million users by 2022, guess what? It's going to keep going. Guess what? We're going to still work on it. <laughs> If it makes you feel any better, again, but we don't want to promise that. <laughs> it's just because that doesn't encourage what we want to happen, it's which is people start transition. to adopt. And so hopefully some of those sites that are six or seven years old, maybe as you start to update them for a new design or something else, that could be an opportunity to also bring them over to Gutenberg. Or maybe that's something their users or you as a developer want to bring in. Like I've definitely, I, by the way, I have WordPresses that are 16 and 17 years old. <laughs> and it's been kind of fun to go back and see like things that I used to have to custom code or have a lot of HTML and custom CSS, I can now recreate in Gutenberg. That's a little bit of work, but it's also really, it's kind of interesting and I learn as I do it. And I know it's going to be forward compatible because Gutenberg 100% is the future of WordPress. Yeah. So Thanks. if you were to ask me 20 years from now, is there still a classic editor? I mean, I hope not, but only because no one wants to use it. <laughs> so sometime in between there, uh, its usage will dwindle to the point where it'll maybe either be a niche plugin or not something officially supported. It's still open source, so that still means that people will be able to customize however they like. There's people who only post to WordPress using a command line. So use that as an example of some pretty niche things can still be actively supported and maintained. Uh, but 
I do appreciate if at some point in the future, you take a look at Gutenberg again and try it out. I'm trying uh, to play with it on new projects, but on projects with thousands of pages, uh, how do I transfer that? There's no script for that. We should make a script for that then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll do the last couple, maybe two or three. Um, What's up, Matt? Hey. Hey. <laughs> My name is Christy, and I have a question for you. You are a CEO, so you know, or you have consultants that know uh, that a key component of any successful project or organization is good stakeholder management. So this idea that in any group, we have a ton of people, and a lot of the time, most of the time, they have competing interests. Mm -hmm. If we have buyers and sellers, the buyer wants to get the most money, the seller wants to get the least money, and we have to find a place in between. I think we could argue that the WordPress open source project has even more stakeholders than the traditional corporate structure that maybe has employees, buyers, sellers, shareholders. I'm curious <laughs> what we're doing in 2020 and beyond to bring all of the different people with different motivations together in the WordPress project to work towards a common goal. The questions that we see here demonstrate, I can probably list about seven different kinds of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With different motivations, different incentives, different things they want to see. Mm -hmm. How do we get everybody working towards that same goal of what we saw in the video, which is making the project and the world a better place? That is a good question. And I am so relieved you defined what stakeholder management was. <laughs> Because for a moment there, I'm like, man, I'm a terrible CEO. <laughs> I have no idea what she means by that. So <laughs> You got to thank Andrew Nason for that one, because he texted me and said, what's your question? And I said it, and he goes, you got to define stakeholder management. <laughs> oh, thanks, Andy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm maybe not the most corporate CEO ever. Uh, in terms of, but I do think about that problem quite a bit, which is there are so many people with different types of interests different incentives, different motivations, different things that are important to them, uh, special interest uh, within WordPress. And, uh, you know, it can be cacophonous sometimes, right? Like all the voices in the room. I also think it's part of what makes WordPress beautiful and exciting is that those voices uh, occasionally come together and create like a chorus where we can all go in the same direction. We're never going to make everyone happy. And not everyone's ever going to agree with all of our decisions. I'm sure there's many things I presented today that a lot of people would strongly agree with or say would be bad for the web, which is opposite of our goals. But what we do try to do is put our philosophy out there of what we're trying to do, uh, the web that we want to see, and the things that are really core to us. I came up in an earlier question, things like transparency and open source. And then say, if those are also important to you, you know, get on the bus and we'll take this journey together. If not, Guess what? It's open source. So you can still, <laughs> you can create evil press or something. And <laughs> can? Sure. It's open source. You can fork it. You can change it. You can take the code. You can not fork it. You can use it for whatever purpose you like. And, um, and so you're not forced. But if you do want to be part of this, what I would term more the community of people contributing to WordPress, um, we do have to think about how we present things. So it's state of the word, but it's also what happens at meetups, what goes on the blog, what gets translated into the 50 plus languages that WordPress is translated into. It, it very much is a global and multifactorial problem um, that uh, is part of the fun of it. It's, um, I was listening to a, oh, I, was, I think it was a podcast with, um, who's the guy that does the documentaries like Vietnam, jazz, Ken Burns, right? The one that has the awesome pan effect. How cool that he has effects built into iMovie. Like, to be a director, to have that, your name in effect someday. Um, and he was talking about, they have this neon sign in their editing room. And uh, I'm going to butcher it. But I think it said, it, it's complex. <laughs> because every, he covers these really interesting, rich stories. And for everything, there's kind of a surface story, like the kind of tweet version that you can say about what happened in, gosh, something like the Civil War or music called jazz. Um, but the reality is it's really, really complex. And 
I try to, I thought about getting like a neon thing that said that from my office after I heard that podcast. I think it was uh, the podcast he recorded, Tim Ferriss, if you want to check it out. Um, so thank you for your question. Thank you. All right, next to last. Hey, Matt. My name is Jeremy Ward. I'm a senior backend engineer with Web Dev Studios. And uh, I was excited to see in your presentation today and was aware of the decision last year to upgrade the minimum version of PHP. Mm -hmm. And it's great to hear 83% adoption, I believe you said it was, on WordPress 5.2. So 83% of people on WordPress 5.2 are running PHP 7 or higher. Right, exactly. Pretty right? cool. And that's awesome. Um, the goal for this year, as I understand it, was to get the minimum version of WordPress onto 7 plus. And of course, I think it's next month that uh, security updates for 7.1 end. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, um, A, if you can elaborate on like the 10%, the, the laggards, the ones that are still on the old versions, and, um, and the conversations that you are planning on having with web hosts to get them up to date so that we can push everything forward. Sure. So one common bit of info that a lot of people don't know is that uh, web hosts that were running older versions of PHP that the PHP project itself was no longer officially supporting were still getting backported security fixes, usually from third-party companies that they would subscribe to or things like that. So although 7.0 will no longer be officially supported by the PHP project, it's a little bit like when we say we don't want to support old things. <laughs> they just don't want to have to deal with it. They want to focus on making the, the new thing. But their you know, web hosts often subscribe to services, and they'll be those people will still have PHP security updates. So it's not actually as end of life as a PHP project would like you to, to feel. Um, in terms of what we need to do to pick up those old people, um, not old people, people on old versions of, <laughs> sorry, I made a generational mistake there. Um, people on old versions of PHP is, um, we gotta work with the host. You know, it's really something where, you know, apart from a small handful that might be running like servers in their closet and on their home connection. Like pretty much everyone runs WordPress on a web host, on a server image, on you know the great web hosts that sponsor WordCamps. And um, so one thing we're looking to start doing is start identifying which host or have those older versions and just use that to talk to them. They might not even know themselves that they have still have half a million WordPress is still on PHP 5.6 or something. So if we can expose that to them, and kind of offer the best practices of what we've seen folks do to upgrade. By the way, this is also an area where I've seen direct competitors, hosts that compete each with each other for the same customers, actually help each other out and open source their scripts and things that they use to do upgrades. Bluehost did some amazing stuff there. So we can bring these folks along, but it's not the end user that probably needs to hear it at this point because they've been seeing the notices and everything for a while now. It's that we need to start working uh, with wherever they're paying to host their website. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, and we're going to end on this one. I apologize. I know there's a few more questions, but I'm very cognizant of time. And for the folks that didn't get to it, come on up afterwards. I'm happy to talk to you. All right, so you've got the last question. Please introduce yourself. You're the celebrity that was on that video, right? <laughs> now I just want to go and oh. curve down somewhere because it's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> Hi, Matt. My name is Francesca. I'm the WordPress Community Manager at SiteGround, and right now I serve as the release coordinator for WordPress 5.3. Hopefully... <laughs> yes. November 12th, right? <laughs> November 12th. Uh, I'm just a shouty, bossy lady. <laughs> Everyone else is doing the work. But one thing <laughs> that I do... I Not also bossy, you have executive management skills. <laughs> yes, yes. Th thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm also a good listener. So one thing that came up um, over this past few months in conversations with many different uh, people involved in the release is that they feel it will be great to have a calendar of releases, a year-long calendar uh, of releases. So how do you feel about having a calendar for 2020 for the next? Because you said yourself, three releases at best every year. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about having a calendar for 2020? This is a good one to end on. Ah. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, there's no reason not to. We do kind of a version of that early in the year. Yeah. So we might as well map it out. As long as people realize that those dates might move, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
You know, well, in the New Yorker, when they say the going ons about town, they're like, musicians leave complicated lives, developers leave complicated lives, and some things might move those. It depends who's bossing them around, you know. <laughs> but uh, ooh. Oh, maybe the releases you lead will be super on time. Who so, knows? We'll, we'll, we have we'll ten days to see. <laughs> and the place that we should have that, and we have had it a little bit more in the past. I guess we just fell out of updating it. Would be slash about slash roadmap. Probably the best place for that. Yeah. And uh, that shows the dates of previous releases, the jazzers they chose, and then we've previously showed some of the updating ones. But I guess we, we fell behind there. So let's fix that up at Contributor Day. Let's that do will this. be done. As we wrap up, um, just very quickly, I would love to invite all the organizers for WordCamp US this, uh, this year to the stage really quick. So if you were involved in organizing, doing something, come on up, come on up quickly, quickly. Maybe not too quickly. We did, was it WordCamp? We did have a an injury when the organizers were coming up at a previous one. So come up carefully. <laughs> okay, come on, come on, come on, come on. Keep coming, keep coming. All right, wait for everyone to get here. Oh, coming from this side too. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Look at this, look at this. Is this the 47 that we talked about earlier? Just about. I'm glad we had it ramped. That's awesome. All right, we're missing one, but so. Can we do a quick round of applause for putting this together? Thank you so much. <laughs> and all right, let's go. Thank you all so much for an amazing State of the Word. I'll see you next year. <laughs>